All right, we're going to do an exercise. So what I want you to do, children, face the congregation. Now, children, I need you to close your eyes. Hold your hands across your chest. The adults can help you if they need to. Now, adults, you need to stand behind the children. So children, I want your eyes closed. I want your hands folded across your chest. And on the count of three, I want you to lean backwards. But your eyes have to stay closed. Try to stay as straight as you can as you lean backwards. Eyes closed, hands across your chest. On the count of three, stay straight as you can and lean backwards, fall backwards, in fact. I want you to fall backwards. One, two, three. Whoa, that was pretty good. Give them a hand. Thank you, children. That was it. You guys just did an exercise in trust. So one of the children, you want to describe to me what you did and what it felt like? Go ahead, Caleb. It felt like you were falling into oblivion. I like that answer, Anna. You've done it before. Well, that's good. It wasn't really scary. Okay, I like that. Anyone else? Saray. We felt like you were falling into the bed. Okay, Montre. Falling into the pit. <laughs> well, hey, he's like in the backyard, the parents have dug a pit for me. No. But thank you. It, it, you definitely felt that you were falling. But you had to trust that the adult behind you was going to catch you. That can help summarize what the letter of James is about. Whether we're children or we're adults, when we say that we have a faith in something, we are leaning the weight of our lives on the object of our faith. And the way James wrote it in his letter was that if we're actually leaning our lives on the object of our faith, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, it will work out in a series of actions that we can see in our lives, just as we saw the action of these dear children leaning back into the hands or the arms of the adults that were behind them. You see, our children demonstrated an act of trust or an act of faith. Yet if they had stood there and even one of them had said, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not doing that. And we said, well, don't you trust your parent? Don't you trust the adult? And they said, oh, I fully trust them that they will carry me. Like, like imagine if Hannah said, yeah, I've done this before and I fully trust my mom, but this time I don't know. My, my mom likes to do practical jokes. Maybe she'll just like stand behind and then move out the way and I'll fall and hit my head. So I don't, I don't trust that much. You see, it's one thing to say I trust. It's another thing to put it into action. That's what we're gonna be looking at these next few weeks in the book of James. What does it mean for us to pursue and put our faith into kingdom focused action? Because as James wrote this letter, it's not just enough to say, oh yes, I have faith in Christ. It is, we have to have a profession of belief, but then that profession must be accompanied by action that grows within us, that flows from the faith we have in Christ. In this introduction from James 1.1, 1, 1, what I'd like to do is just look at who wrote this letter, to whom he wrote it, why he wrote it, and what, interestingly enough, what or whom it is about. So if you look at James 1.1, 1, 1, and he just wrote, James, he spoke of himself as a servant to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Let's pray. Lord God, we are blessed 
that you have given us and called us to have faith in you. We want our faith to be active. So that in each point of this letter, we, we, as you call us to be a people of faith that's demonstrated in how, Lord, we embrace our temptation, demonstrated in the way that we seek you for wisdom, demonstrated in the way that we speak to each other, <clears throat> demonstrated. Name. Amen. So who wrote this letter? He, James, the brother of Jesus. Now, James did not believe in Jesus um, during our Lord's ministry. That was pretty evident, especially if you read the first few verses of John chapter 7, where they get into it a little bit. You know how family can get into it just a little bit. And they got into it a little bit. And it was clear that James not only did not believe in Jesus and who he claimed to be, James was actually kind of making fun of him. James was like, I'm, I'm like, if you would have said, James, how's your brother Yeshua? He would have said, Yeshua has a Yeshua complex and he needs prayer because we think he's a bit thrown off. He thinks, he literally thinks he is God's Messiah. I grew up with him. That ain't happening. He's a good guy. In fact, he is a Boy Scout. He is a choir boy, Boy Scout, goody two shoes. He never does anything wrong. He always helped around the house. He was always completely obedient. He went to Sabbath every time. There are times James would say, I skipped out on Sabbath a few times. He went to Sabbath every time he read scripture he was everybody's favorite in church but he's no messiah he just yeshua that's how james if i can summarize it thought of his older brother now in terms of older james was probably two to three years younger than jesus so he would have grown up with the lord james came to faith after seeing Jesus, when Jesus himself appeared to him following his resurrection. You can read about that. I'm not going to read all of these passages, but you can read about that in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus made a special appearance to his brother James, proving to James that he was in fact the Messiah, that he was in fact Yeshua, and that he was alive. James would have clearly known that Jesus was crucified. He probably may have even been somewhere in the vicinity Perhaps he was utterly brokenhearted that his brother's delusion he was thinking at that time had gotten to this. But James would have known he was crucified. James would have known he would have been buried. James would have said, yes, my, my brother had this ideation of being the Messiah and it got him killed and now that's that. But then Jesus himself appeared to James at some point following his resurrection and called him to be an apostle. You can, you can find that in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul mentions that the Lord appeared to James. Having been called by his older half brother to be an apostle, James actually became a leading apostle in the ancient church. And you can read about that in Galatians and Acts chapter 9. Paul says that James was a leader in the church. It was James exercising leadership in the church at the first church council in Acts 15 that spoke from the scripture from the book of Amos, telling the church that the Gentiles should not be forced to adopt Jewish customs. James's leadership concentrated on Jewish believers, exhorting them to follow Christ. And yet James was also clear that they should retain their cultural heritage and keep Jewish law. Apparently he was very, very clear about this. He was very strong about this. Listen to how Paul described it when Paul had to confront Peter about something like this. And you can find it in Acts, excuse me, in Galatians chapter two. We get reading from verse 11. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, 
He used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. You note there that Paul said certain men came from James. Now what he meant there wasn't that James sent certain men down to demand that non-Jewish people live like Jews. No. What had happened was, if I can use that vernacular, James was, it seems, very clear that the law, at least by Jewish people, should continue to be monitored and kept and that the cultural traditions should still be in place. Some of those who follow James took that a bit too far. That's what happened. But James was a leader. He was a leader among Jewish Christians. He was an apostolic pastor or pastoral apostle. His ministry was different, say, from Peter. Peter was an apostle who certainly continued to go to Jewish people to declare the Messiah. James was an apostle who then served the spiritual needs and well-being and welfare of those Jewish people who had come to the Messiah. Keep in And in Judea, in those towns, that there were dozens of small groups of Jewish people who had come to know the Lord. James's pastoral focus, I believe, clearly came out in the letter that he wrote. It was a letter that was an extension of his pastoral ministry in which he strongly encouraged God's people in the way that they thought, spoke, and lived and how that was connected to their faith in Christ. And as we work through the pastoralism he made so that we may continue to grow and mature in our faith. And let me just say one more thing. I wanna encourage, especially those of us, maybe you're in a home with someone who has not believed in Christ, and you've witnessed to them, you've lived before them, they've seen your life, and maybe you're in even anguish that they, they've not come to Christ. You're wondering, why is it that they haven't seen Christ the way I do? You're wondering, what else could I do? And sometimes maybe you're even getting down on your own witness. You're saying, see, if I had done things this way or, or, or that way, or if I, if I had just said the right thing the right way, or if I had not reacted wrongly, maybe that's what the Lord would do. Well, James grew up in a house with Yeshua. I'm putting the look on my face to emphasize that Yeshua was perfect and flawless. And yet James, towards the end of Jesus' ministry, is still mocking his brother. It wasn't until after Jesus appeared to him that James believed. Keep praying. Keep hoping. Keep that witness you have alive. At some point, it's going to happen. The living God will call that person who you are so deeply, deeply concerned about who is in your own house and you wonder how come they don't see who the Lord is and yet it will happen. It happened in my life. For years I'd witnessed to my own father and it seems we had gotten to a brick wall and I did everything I could. I pulled every passage I could to explain that Jesus was God and you must believe him for salvation. He says, well, Jesus is, is good and he's okay, but I, I can't, he's just not, I can't see it. He's not God. And then something happened. Or should I say someone happened, the power of the Holy Spirit. And my father believed, embraced Jesus as Lord, Savior, God, King. James grew up with Yeshua. And yet he mocked him. But then the Lord appeared to him. Keep praying. Keep living. Don't give up. God is at work. That person that you are in anguish for because they, they dislike, no, I'm not getting it. We're going to pray with you that the Lord will show 
him to them, and they too will believe. So that's who wrote this letter. James, the Lord's brother, the one the Lord appeared to specifically, called to be a pastoral apostle, one who would go and really shepherd and encourage the um, Jewish believers um, who would come to faith in Christ. That brings us to who he wrote it to. To whom did he write this letter? Now, most New Testament scholars believe that James, the, the epistle of James, this letter, was the very first letter written to the church, around 50 to 52 AD. At this point, the church, the ancient church, consisted mainly of Jewish believers who had connected their faith with their ancient cultural heritage. Additionally, many Jewish persons had believed and they were spread and scattered throughout the Roman Empire. This phrase, the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, or the 12 tribes of the dispersion, it was a way of identifying Jewish persons living throughout the Roman Empire who had believed and embraced Jesus Christ as their King, their Lord, their Savior, their Messiah. James was, did not mean the original 12 tribes of the ancient nation. Basically, to be cohesive tribes after they were invaded by Assyria. And you can read about that in 2 Kings 17. Using the term dispersion was a James way of saying that these were those of God's ancient people who had embraced his promise of salvation centered in Jesus Christ. Dispersion, this phrase, it's, it's an ancient, affectionate theological term indicating God's solemn promise to be present with his people while they live. from Jerusalem to Babylon. God viewed his people as exiles. That is, they were to continue to live up and live out his character, his will, his worship, his ways in a land that was not their own so they can continue to represent him well. And in so doing, remind themselves and their children that we still believe God's promise. Because the promise to return to the Lord wasn't simply a promise to return to a land, but a promise to return to the living God himself. Listen again as the Lord unfolds this promise a bit more in Jeremiah, this time from Jeremiah 33, beginning at verse 15. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. For this is what the Lord says, David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of Israel, nor will the Levitical priest ever fail to have a man stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to present sacrifices. What an amazing way to describe Jesus Christ, the one who sits right on the right hand of God the Father, ruling his kingdom, and who is at the same time the man who has made the perfect sacrifice for us so that we too can be those who are seated in heavenly places and who can say we are to the delight of the living God because we belong to him through the promise of Jesus Christ. James wrote this letter, dear ones, to a group of God's people who were still in exile. That is, this world was not their home. This world, this country, this community, it is not 
nor will it ever be the place where we will find our full, complete, total shalom. It can't be that. It is too filled with unbelief, with ungodliness of sin, and with brokenness. And so, when we say that we're exiles, we recognize that we don't look for complete satisfaction, complete well-being in this home, but we don't ignore the fact that we do live here and that we're called to live here and we're called to represent the Lord well and be a taste, a foretaste of the kingdom. And I think James really hits that so many times in his letter, especially when James talks about rich folks. James, as the young people say, he goes in. You know, I hadn't read James in a while. And I'm reading James and I'm thinking, man, if I'm back in this time and I'm making bank and feeling good about the fact that I'm making bank, James is coming in hard. He like, look, just stop acting like making bank is all there is to knowing God. Anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. But the, the idea is that we live in this world. We represent the Lord. We are exiles in that we're not so tied to this world or to this country or to this society that we think that our complete total well-being must arrive through this country. We're exiles in that way, but we're not exiled from the living God. We continue to be his. So they were his exiles throughout the Roman Empire, placed as his witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ to their families and communities. And so like us, they were believers who struggled with temptation, who struggled with worldliness, like we do, who struggled with what I call sanitized ungodliness. Okay, now you wonder what in the world is sanitized ungodliness? Okay. We can tend to speak of unsanitized ungodliness when we look at some, especially of the egregious sinful behavior of the world. We can see, see those folks, those are the ones that are, that are really worldly, just acting as, as awful as they can be, flaunting their sin before the Lord. Sanitized ungodliness is the kind of ungodliness that James wrote of. Read through the book of James this week. It's a short book. It's five chapters. You might be able to read it in one setting. Note how James doesn't deal with many of the sins that Paul wrote of. Because Paul many times wrote to Greeks who were coming out of pagan idolatry with pagan idolatrous sinful actions. James wrote of the sins of the saints. That's how my old pastor, Reverend, Hor Reverend Dr. Horace W. Shepherd Sr. would say it. The sins of the saints are the way that we talk to one another, the way that we think of one another, the way that we cut down one another, one another by the way that we speak. That sanitizes ungodliness. It's a way of hiding behind the Lord to sin in ways and yet still try to keep a veneer of religiosity. Well, thank you, sister. Again, there were people just like us who struggled with temptation, worldliness, sanitized ungodliness, and struggled with putting their faith into kingdom-focused action. That's why James's letter is so relevant to us in the here and now. For we too can all too easily drift from a growing walk in our Lord into a kind of lukewarm faith. One that would never actually reject God or speak ill of the Lord. One that would never directly challenge the Lord but one that would keep his worship, his word, his mission at arm's length. 
So that's who wrote the book, James. That's to whom he wrote the book, Jewish believers who in many ways, just like us, who were exiles, who had embraced their faith, continued to hold on to their heritage, but were in danger of still drifting from the Lord into a kind of sanitized ungodliness, worldliness, as well as temptation. Why did he write it? Well, again, I think the content of this letter, it, it, it's interesting because it does not read at first like a letter. After the greeting, James just gets right into it. It's more like, if you read through it, it's similar to how Jesus taught and preached the Sermon on the Mount. He just dives in and goes from topic to topic to topic. I don't think in seminary, and maybe we need to speak to, to Peter, um, John, and, and the apostles. I don't think they set up the seminary rightly because they didn't teach James how to do expository preaching. He, he didn't start from the book of Deuteronomy and go verse by verse. So we need to speak to him about that because he simply goes right into it. And he seems to go right from one thing to another to another. Again, I believe it flowed out, this letter flowed out from Jesus' pastoral ministry as he addressed the issues he saw in the lives of those he served and served well. He knew them. He knew where they needed to grow. He knew the issues that could inhibit their growth. He knew how easily they might try to hide behind growing and hide behind their religion because they were good at that. Like, I'm good at that. You see, this letter was from James's pastoral ministry and addressed the issues that he saw in the lives of those he served. And these issues that James addressed help us see some of the main marks. Please listen carefully. The issues that James addressed in this letter, this is why I'm asking and encouraging you to read this letter sometime this week, they address some of the main marks or characteristics of biblical growth and maturity. Biblical growth begins for us to happen when we understand the nature and what God is doing through our temptations. Biblical growth begins to happen when we more and more learn to lean on the word of God. Biblical growth happens when we have a right assessment of ourselves and we're looking to walk in the Lord's humility. Biblical growth happens when on Facebook, Lance, you learn to be slow to speak. Well, slow to become angry, quick to listen. I'm gonna say this again, Lance. Biblical growth happens, Lance, when you are quick to listen, slow to open your mouth or to get on the keyboard, slow to become angry. I want to see this, this whole in section one more time. These issues help us because the issues that James raised are some of the main marks or characteristics of biblical growth and maturity. And so when we ask ourselves, are we walking in, in a mature walk with the Lord? Are we beginning to grow and develop in our faith? Though James doesn't address every single issue, these are many of the issues that we can know, that we can say, I need to be growing in this issue then. The focus of James's letter is a Christ-centered, down-to-earth godliness that flows from the profession of our faith. From James's perspective, dearly loved ones in Christ, true faith leads to an active, Christ-centered lifestyle. True faith must lead to an active, Christ-centered lifestyle. As James wrote in chapter 2, verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And that's the way we're going to work through this letter. It will help us to see the areas of growth that we should consistently cultivate. We're going to be like the children that we saw in the very beginning of the message. We're going to fall into the arms of our Savior. We're going by the grace of God, through the power of the Spirit, 
Say, Lord, put our faith into action that when I say to myself that I believe in you and I see how it should be lived out, even in this letter, that by the grace of God, since that is your calling on my life, that what I will aim for my life to be about. We'll talk much more about James, what he wrote about in the coming weeks, but let me leave you with this, because this is what I think is beautiful about this letter, especially considering the fact that it was written by Jesus's younger half-brother. James's letter can appear to be a series of disconnected thoughts on practical Christianity. But I see it as James's spirit-led reflection on the life of his brother, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for those snaps. That's what the young folks doing it these days. For all though, read, especially read through chapter one of James. Christ was the one who endured temptation with joy, and James saw that. James was there, he saw Jesus being tempted by evil and enduring it and doing so with joy. Jesus did that because enduring temptation and refusing to give in was a path where he had to live to lead a perfectly sinless, flawless life. And he had to do that so that we could get his perfect permanent right standing that he earned as a free gift once we acknowledge our need for it and ask for it. 